Yeah, let's ask the guy who's broadcasting from his bathtub about this. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to point out <laughs> how we're about half an hour into this. This is deep sea, baby. He's, uh, he's just doing Rod a soak. In a deep a, soak. He's just soaking in a tub right now. There's no water in it, but I don't know about your investment here, Steve. Either this one's going to the moon or you've I know, I think the it's the it's the eccentric uh, ones. I, I I'm Steve Jobs probably did an interview I'm from sure. his hot tub at yeah, some point. Yeah. That's some carefoot, oil. eating yeah. fruit with no deodorant for three years. Yes. This week in startups is brought to you by Eight Sleep. Good sleep is the ultimate game changer. The newest generation of the pod, the Pod 4 Ultra, has arrived. Head to 8sleep.com slash twist and use code twist to get $350 off the Pod 4 Ultra. Mercury. With Mercury, you can simplify your financial operations with banking and software that power your critical financial workflows, all within the one thing every business needs, a bank account. And with new bill pay and accounting integrations, you can pay bills faster and stay in control of company spend. Apply in minutes at mercury.com. Mercury, the art of simplified finances. And Northwest Registered Agent. Start your business fast and secure with Northwest Registered Agent. In just 10 clicks and 10 minutes, set up your entire business identity, name, address, mail service, phone, email, website, and domain. Everything you need to launch your business in minutes. For $39 business formation, visit northwestregisteredagent.com slash twist. All right, everybody, welcome back to this week in startups. As you've probably heard, the global transition to EVs is well underway. Uh, EV sales up 52% year over year. Tesla and BYD in China, they're battling for market share. And uh, obviously, US and China are the leading markets for these electric vehicles. But it's stressing this massive growth is stressing the global mineral market. It's causing geopolitical tensions, as you probably know, not to mention an environmentally heavy race to dig the required materials out of the ground. And so uh, it's no good to help the planet by moving EVs if we wreck the planet while transitioning. So we need a new way to get minerals out of the earth and into our EVs. Today's guest is working on solving that problem. And they are looking somewhere under the ocean to find these minerals so that we can keep these EVs flowing uh, and save the planet. The metals company wants to collect polymetallic nodules from the ocean floor. The company calls them a battery in a rock. I found out about this company because my bestie Steve Jervitson, the founder and managing partner of Future Ventures, is absolutely over the moon about this <laughs> startup. And I asked him to bring the founder so we can talk all about it uh, here on This Week in Startups, Gerard Barron, the CEO of Metals Company. Welcome to the program. Welcome back to the program, Steve. Thank you. Great to be in. All right. Tell me about this investment, why you're so excited about it, Steve. And then uh, Gerard, maybe we'll ask you to just explain technically, operationally, how you found this opportunity. Sure. Thanks, Jason. Yeah. So I, as you know, was on the board of Tesla for like 11 years and am a true believer in the future of sustainable transportation, right? So one of Elon's early statements that all vehicles would be electric is just the question of, you know, when, not if, uh, with the ironic exception of rockets, um, is something I believe truly to my core. And as you look at that landscape at large, um, you know, clearly energy generation and storage is one of the key factors, but really batteries, it all comes down to batteries, you know, grid storage, vehicle storage. Um, we have the capacity to generate the energy we need, but we need to be able to store it and make it transportable. So as you double click on that and say, why, you know, what, if anything is going to hinder this uh, vision of a sustainable carbon free energy future, <clears throat> it's, uh, you know, raw materials like metals that you need to make these batteries, to make the vehicles efficient, to make them, to make the design close. <clears throat> um, and so, and when you look at that around the world, there's been some pretty profound shifts that have occurred even in the early fledgling days of the um, automotive industry's transition in the use of materials like nickel and cobalt. And you'll hear about copper, you'll hear about a lot of materials, manganese, that are uh, parts of the cathode of these batteries that are in short supply relative to the Earth's resources. And so they, you know, let, let me jump to a conclusion. You know, as you look at where you could get these things from, we're currently mining the most environmentally sensitive and valuable resources on earth tropical rainforests in indonesia and africa and elsewhere um there's been a massive sea change in the last five years to do that 
And it's just terrific, right? As someone who cares about the earth and its stewardship, the uh, alternative, <laughs> taking, picking these rocks off the bottom of the sea, thing like literally like lifting golf balls that are free standing, not attached to anything um, and available for us. It's almost like, <laughs> I don't know, it's almost like the dinner menu has been laid out before us, but we're just not picking those rocks up. And it is, you know, environmentally the opposite end of the spectrum. It's, it's like the second least uh environmentally rich area on earth like i think only antarctica is more barren uh to life and the life is primarily bacteria down there by biomass uh, far and away so I make mean, a long story short you have the resources we need geopolitically america and the west would like to have sources that aren't china and you'd like to do so in a way that isn't going to further you know climate change and in environmental species degradation um as is currently happening in spades uh in indonesia all right, Gerard, explain to us, and maybe you could show us here, uh, how this all works. I am, le- I, based on what Steve said, there are nodules, rocks, mm-hmm. on the bottom of the ocean, mm-hmm. just waiting to be picked up. Wh- when did we find out about these rocks, you know, in the bottom of the ocean? How deep are they? How do you collect them? I- I- and why haven't we been doing this? Why haven't we been doing this all along, I guess, is a, mm-hmm. an obvious question. Yeah, so thanks, Jason. Well, We've known about these nodules that lie on the bottom of the ocean floor since the 1870s. And they were discovered by the British, actually, who sailed around the world, curious to know what lay on the bottom of the ocean floor. And so Mm -hmm. for four years, HMS Challenger sailed around the world with a dredge or a basket off the back. And they, after four years, were coming home down from Japan across the Pacific and came across this patch about a thousand miles off the coast of Mexico. It's now known as the Clarion Clipperton, and it is by far the world's largest deposit of nickel and cobalt and manganese. In fact, there's around 70% of the known reserves of those three metals in this one deposit that covers about 1.5% of our ocean floor. And You couldn't wish, as Steve was saying, to have these nodules in a better place, because if we take it all back to first principles, it makes sense that we carry out extractive industries in parts of the planet where there is the least life, not the most life. And in the abyssal plain, about half of our ocean is categorized as the abyssal plain. It's it's uh, in this picture here is around 4,200 meters below sea level. You'll notice there are no uh, plants. And there's not a lot of um, large megafauna either because there's not much food down there. In fact, if you measure the amount of biomass, there's around 10 grams of biomass per square meter. Mm. And more than 80% of that is bacteria living in the sediment. And so what we've been doing for the last 12 years now is studying this part of the ocean floor. Um there was a there was a window also after being discovered in the 1970s when the industry almost got started. You had Shell and BP and Mitsubishi and Lockheed Martin were all involved building the systems to go collecting these very same rocks. Uh, Rio Tinto had built a processing plant, and they wanted to move it into commercial production, but the United Nations stepped in because 50 years ago the world had not agreed who owned the oceans and where do your uh-huh. borders begin. And end. And that was finally resolved when UNCLOS was signed in 1982. And basically, what UNCLOS says is that as a sovereign, you own everything within 12 miles of your coastline and you have an economic right to everything within 200 miles. But beyond that, it's owned by everybody. Mm. And they set up a group called the International Seabed Authority that is made up of 168 countries plus the European Union. And they regulate this part of the ocean. And so they are the people that we have applied to and been granted our exploration licenses. And later this year, we'll be lodging our application to move from the exploration phase to the exploitation phase. So it's a really exciting time for the industry. And so, you know, to your question, Jason, about, well, why hasn't it happened before? It's because of that regulatory hurdle. And you know, one of the bad things about having a regulator that represents 168 countries is it's a little bit slow. But that's also one of the good things as well, because one of the the biggest challenges and risks in the mining industry is sovereign risk, because countries can change the rules, they can mm. nationalize assets and so on. 
So it's a really you know interesting time right now, and um, we've been on this journey as the Nettles Company since 2011, mm. and we expect to be commercially picking these nodules up in 2026. Steve, you have a nodule there. Maybe you just hold it up here. Sure. It's essentially mm -hmm. a rock. Yeah. Um, now, how are these formed? Is it because the ocean is so chaotic with tides and all that that they just break apart from the floor or there are like mountains down there that have just over thousands, mm. hundreds of thousands of years just broke apart? Yeah. Explain well, to us they're, they're, how these yes. things formed. Well, there are three different types of metals in the ocean, and this slide shows you, if you can see it, it's on, yep. on the left-hand side of polymetallic nodules, and that's what we at the Metals Company are exclusively focused on. And, and you know, the amazing thing is they just happen to have the mixture of metals that we're going to, going to need billions of tons more of, nickel and copper and cobalt and manganese. And how they form is they precipitate the metals that are in the seawater or the sediment. and so. Well, so they grow a little bit like a pearl grows. And yeah. the reason why this field of nodules is so interesting is because if you look to the east, you have the Rockies and the Andes, which were covered in nickel and copper. And so over millennia, these metal tops eroded into the Pacific Ocean and you had currents pick them up and from the north and the south. And then they met together and headed west in mm -hmm. this area now known as the Clarion Clipperton Zone. But but there are other types of metals in the ocean as well, um, sea, sea mounts and also hydrothermal vents. And we are not focused on those. Hmm. They, are, they form in much shallower waters, and they also do have a lot more biodiversity and life around them. And so we think that polymetallic nodules in the first instance is absolutely the right place to be focusing this new industry. How do you collect them? I mean, is it a, and how far down are they? Is this as simple as just sending a net down there? Or do you have to send submersibles? Uh, because, mm. Steve, this, mm -hmm. you know, as uh, capital allocators, it seems to me, just from the outside, you tell me if I'm correct, that we needed to have more demand for people maybe to see this opportunity. Obviously, Gerard saw it a long time ago, but, you know, the, the massive number of EVs being made makes this, I guess, um, like oil, you know, if you take oil from Canada where there's sand in it, at a certain dollar per barrel, you know, $80, $90, it becomes viable to take that oil and take the sand out of it. Other times, it's just not worth it. If oil was $10 right. a barrel, it wouldn't be worth it. So is it a similar kind of thing that happened here? Yeah, <clears throat> there's enough of the essential metals for the NMC batteries, as they're called, um, in this uh, sort of plot that TMC, the metals company has to electrify the entire North America fleet. So all vehicles becoming electric just off this one first field. And it's not their only field. <clears throat> and uh, to your other question, yeah, it's a robotic vessel. I'll, I'll let you uh, go through exactly what it's like, but you got to have robots out of the ocean just to, just to make it cool and make it efficient. Um, and the uh, pricing is, as you say, you have to be competitive. There are a whole bunch of marginal projects where you enter the market at you know better price economics you can have shutdown economics for the others as well so that you're not you know destroying these ecosystems um the way they have in the past so you know that's the ideal goal but right now there's just a you know we're not meeting supply in other words if all the automotive companies were to be serious about the conversion of electrical uh, conversion you know vehicles and conversion they just would not have enough metals from current mechanisms of of mining you, you would need more and so this is uh, we, we come online to just to provide that, uh, especially in the West. You've heard me talk about how great my sleep is. Sleep is a superpower, and my superpower is eight sleep. They've got the amazing pod that you add to your existing mattress. It will cool you down or warm you up, depending on which side of the bed you're on. I like it nice and cool. I sleep deeper. I am a sleep king, and you might be a sleep king or queen too, and you can be one if you get the Pod 4 Ultra. That's right, Pod 4 Ultra is out. And it is definitively the greatest tool for helping your sleep. Pod 4 Ultra can cool down each side of the bed to 20 degrees Fahrenheit below room temperature. It's a better cool than the air conditioner. So I can put the air conditioner on a reasonable temperature and then keep my Pod Ultra even a little bit cooler than that. And they also introduced an adjustable base that fits between you and your mattress and your bed frame. So you know when you want to read and your partner wants to sleep? 
Well, now reading and sleeping positions are right there to help you unwind after a hectic day. You can even elevate just a few degrees automatically to help with your snoring if that's one of your challenges. Not only that, it has sensors that will track your sleep time, all the phases of sleep, your HRV, and your heart rate. So it's basically a wearable that you don't need to wear. I think I get like an extra hour of deep sleep every night because of it. I'm coming into the game with good energy. So here's what I want you to do. Get the sleep you deserve at 8sleep.com slash twist and use the code twist to get 350 bucks off of the Pod 4 Ultra currently shipping to the US, Canada, UK, Europe, and Australia. I love this product so much. I decided to invest in the company. Yeah, so, so tell me about this vacuuming uh, robot we're seeing here. And again, if you're listening to This Week in Startups, we'll sportscast it as always and, and show you what we're, we'll describe what you're seeing. If you want to see it, go to youtube.com and just type in This Week in Startups and you'll find us. Mm. So think of it as um, there, there are two phases of our op operation. And one of them is picking the nodules up and uh, then transporting them to shore. And the other is processing them into battery materials. But the main thing is you need a production vessel. And while in the future, we will build specific special purpose vessels, the first one we converted was a oil and gas drilling ship and it called the Hidden Gem. And it, it, forms, it provides the power. Uh, you connect it with something called a riser, an air riser, which is basically the, the vertical transport mechanism. And then with a electrical uh, cable connected to a robot on the seafloor. And basically, because the nodules are a two-dimensional resource, so they, they lie unattached on the ocean floor. So we don't have to dig or drill to find them. We just have to go down there and pick them up with the greatest efficiency and the least impact. And so our robot crawls along the seafloor and we fire a jet of water at the uh, nodule uh, which creates an inverse pressure, and you'll see it on this video if you're able to. Yeah. What, what effect that does is it lifts the nodules, so you can see them lying on the ocean floor, and if you look closely, you can see um, them being lifted. So we don't go down there and scour and tear up the ocean floor. What we do is we, we pick them up with the greatest efficiency, and, and in fact, this next slide shows you what it looks like once we've been through. Um, this is that same field, 4,200 meters below sea level, where a collector has gone through and picked up these rocks. And it's literally what you leave behind are a, a set of tracks. And so in 2022, we were out on our license area as part of our permitting program. And we were, uh, with our first production vessel, uh, pilot collecting. And so mm -hmm. for six months, we were at sea. We collected, uh, brought home thousands of tons of these nodules. We had a we had a second boat out there, um, which you can see in the background of this picture, which was filled with scientists. Because what we were doing is uh, testing our equipment, if you like. Um, that boat in the middle, the hidden gem, is is production ready, and for 2026. And what we wanted to do was study the impacts as we were collecting it, because. Uh, you know, environmental groups uh, have been uh, having an opinion on this on this industry. Of course, yeah, we founded this company with a heavy uh, thought around the environment because, you know, going back to that first principle discussion, I said, if you really stop and think where are our metals coming from, then it will keep you awake at night because we're pushing into some of our most biodiverse. Um, carbon sinks known as our tropical rainforests to to get the supply of these materials now and people are going but there's no alternative so we've got to keep doing that but there is an alternative there's a much better alternative but we've got to provide the scientific evidence and that's what we've been focused on we've spent 500 million dollars over the last decade much of it on that scientific research to show the impact. So we, we've established baseline studies um, over the last five years of what the environment looks like, how it changes. Let me ask you and a question about these uh, environmentalists. Are they sure. looking at this from a logical way or are they just any disruption is bad and they're purist in that way? Can they keep in their mind, um, Steve or Gerard, I'll open up to you. And Steve, I know you have a lot of experience with this with Tesla. Can they keep in their mind that, you know, there is cost to all of these solutions and that, you know, there are pros and cons and getting electric vehicles and stop burning fossil fuels. Yes, it requires removing minerals. 
uh, you know, from different locations, but that will stop global warming and, and, and will stop pollution. So are they extremists or are they logical, these environmentalists, or is it a range? Because I, when I see environmentalists hopping the fence at the German <laughs> Tesla factory, mm -hmm. it, I'm perplexed because they care about the environment, the forest around the Tesla factory, I guess, is their beef, you know, like, we, we got to keep this like little forest uh, perfect. But uh, the bigger picture is we don't want to burn the entire planet alive, Steve. So yeah, maybe right. you could speak to this, well, uh, I'll say something about also this group of people. Yeah. <laughs> I, and I've seen what this is actually part of what got me really interested in the story is the possibility that it's a you know, in some ways, similar story to ones where we've had more years to reflect on the wisdom or folly of our environmental, stan environmental stance. <clears throat> and so, uh, the answer to your question is there's, there is a gamut. There are enlightened environmentalists like Stuart Brand who say, what is the most environmentally beneficial or benign way to extract the resource to generate energy? And let's do that. I mean, it's pretty common sense, you would think. Uh, and then there are some on the other end of the spectrum who are you know, just say no at all costs. Don't talk to me about the alternatives. They're just no noists. And part of what drives them is, is donations. They're not being sincere about um, actually analyzing the pros and cons of whatever it is they're shutting down because they are, in fact, trying to shut down the most environmentally beneficial way of doing something on planet Earth, right? You might look at nuclear energy the same way, that shutting that down now with, uh, you know, 50 years of hindsight was a huge mistake. Right? The carbon crisis we have and the climate crisis we have, the environmental crisis we have is partially thanks to, uh, you know, a, a just a, an ignorant re resistance to use the most uh, carbon neutral uh, energy source we had, which was nuclear. Same for GMOs and food production um, with European regulation. And, you know, Stuart Brand would be the first to tell you that in both cases, that was just, we were just dead wrong. We were, you know, we did more to harm the environment than anything else. So the framework I like to use and the one that makes sense, the one that Stuart Brand and others would use. Uh, even James Cameron, a lover of the ocean, would use is to say, what is the best way to do something? Not, you know, A versus nothing. It's A versus B. If you're not going to do A, you're going to be doing B, which is better, right? And knowing that we can't just say no to energy, you can't say no to batteries. You like it's just, you know, you'd be promoting the worst health of the ocean if you just said, let's just keep burning oil and gas and have ocean acidification and warming, bleaching the reefs globally. Let's just continue business as usual. And forget about getting off oil and gas, right? You know that's going to kill the oceans. It's such With, a good like, point, Steve. Right? You, like, uh. you have the you you have the Great Barrier Reef, which I right. dove maybe five or six years ago, and the the dive masters were almost and, and Gerard, I know you're from Australia. They were almost embarrassed or heartbroken to show us the white antler coral that had been bleached and was broken and floating at the bottom of the ocean, um, and it, taking these nodules out of this area helps that problem and i think you have to have like a, a little bit of a wider aperture here the no That's nukes right. concerts mm -hmm. did yeah. more damage to the environment than actually having nukes so that's right the world yeah. health organization concluded in a study of chernobyl for example and i'm paraphrasing what they said but the conclusion of what they said was that the human dialogue on nuclear energy has killed more people than nuclear energy meaning the fear Kind of like when the Scud missiles are coming to Israel, people die from heart attacks more than from the missiles themselves. It's kind of a crude analogy, but it's the same idea. Our anxiety over this is worse than it, it is itself. And that, I mean, back to, you know, fundraising. Anything that can stir fear mongering in the emotions of the people is a source of fundraising. It's not a source of truth and it's not the best policy. Brad, maybe you could talk a little bit about what you're up against. Yeah. Yeah. I, I will say that it does come in pockets you know we have some very well-meaning scientists who you know care a lot about this part of the ocean now of course going back to your point we need to take a planetary perspective and so there are some people who care so much about some of the neofauna or or megafauna that has been discovered that they don't want to think about what's happening on land however I can report that we're making some good headway with some pretty well-known NGOs about finding some common ground. And I think the, the reason why we're able to achieve that now is because of the hundreds of millions of dollars that we've spent on independent scientific research. And those results are conclusively showing what the impacts are. So, for example, years ago, um, when our robot 
crawls along the seafloor, it kicks up dust like you would if you drive your car down a dirt track. The question is, how far will the dust travel? How much of it will there be? And some NGOs would say that the dust will travel for thousands of miles, but we always knew that it wouldn't. And, and what our tests of 2022 have done, and MIT have now reported on this off the back of another collector test, is conclusively proven that the sediment only rises two to three meters above the seafloor and up to 98% of it resettles in the same area. Because 4,200 meters in this uh, zone of the ocean is very different to the currents in the midwater column and the top of the column. So once you carry out that robust independent scientific research, that disarms people. And, you know, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. You know, I think the those great scientists who do care about it are like, okay, well, this is showing that there is, uh, you know, your argument seems to be dispelling some of the things that our desktop study uh, was worried about. And we have to approach it from a positive sense. You know, we can't bulldoze our way through opposition, unfortunately. We have to get to the flag on the hill, and that's absolutely what we're doing. But social license is important to us. And I think that eventually we're going to be measuring every single impact that we make when we make these metals. And we want to do that because we've already done the life cycle analyses with independent third parties. Uh, Benchmark Mineral recently completed one for us where we look through the lens of an LCA and we compress the impacts by between 90 and 100%. So, for example, when we move this nodule to shore and process it, we generate no waste and no tailings. We use 100% of the mass. We'll generate up to 90% less CO2 per kilogram of of nickel, for example, compared to the land-based alternative. And so, we know that measuring all of this is going to be really meaningful to car companies because eventually they're going to have to pay for that, whether it's through carbon adjustment mechanisms or or whatever it's going to be. I mean, it's incredibly generous of you, Gerard. I I mean, (laughs) the lunacy of these people at times, I'll say Mm. this, I know you're not going to. uh, Steve, you gave, uh, I think, the middle of the road, Gerard. You're you're incredibly gracious about this. I'll take the other side. These people are lunatics. To to take a rainforest being ripped down, bulldozed, and then the earth with giant, you know, uh, gas powered trucks and and moving all that around compared to lifting up some nodules and 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 a a little bit mm. of sediment moving around is not even comparable. It's not. Even in this, this is the what about ism and the sort of, uh, mm. you know, showing both sides. Any objective person looking at both of these options would clearly say this is the better option. And it, it is exactly to your point, Steve, about nuclear. The Germans turned off all their nuclear power. And w- what are they doing now? They're burning coal and oil from Russia. It's nuts. Mm. It's nuts yep. when people try to make these. Uh, you know, insane uh, comparisons. I'm sorry, I'll get off my soapbox now, but yeah, it's yeah. true. Most startups have tight runways, so keeping your finances in order is critical. And we all know it can be really complicated. You got all these tools, you got bill pay, invoicing, reimbursements, and you have to run all your financial workflows. And we all know these things are all connected to your bank account, but the tools you're using aren't integrated with each other. Luckily, Mercury solves this by powering all of your workflows from the bank account. Having these workflows powered by banking lets you get more accurate visibility into all your money movements. For example, rather than monitoring multiple tools, simply check your bank account for a real-time view of every outgoing payment and every incoming invoice so you control how and when money moves in and out of your business. Why send money to another platform to pay your bills? By getting rid of third-party processing, you pay the bills the moment you need to so you can maximize your cash flow. And you can close your books faster, avoid manual data entry, and minimize errors by categorizing a bill the moment you pay it with details syncing to your accounting software. In the end, you're going to have a simplified workflow that makes you more precise, gives you more control, saves you time, and makes you faster than ever before. So apply in minutes at mercury.com. Join over 200,000 ambitious startups that trust Mercury to simplify their finances and perform at their best. Mercury is a financial technology company, not a bank. Banking services provided by Choice Financial Group and Evolve Bank and Trust, members FDIC. 
while I see some movement in some of the NGOs, I, I see also a lot of really uninformed people who don't care about. And so we don't bother talking to them, right? At the end yeah. of the day, there's a sector of society that we don't spend any energy on because yeah. there's nothing so that we can say. Yeah. They want a degrowth and their way yeah. to success. And we know what the impact of degrowth would be. Mm -hmm. it, it would be civil unrest and who knows, um, you know, what society would look like. So, Steve, so, let's, mm -hmm. let me ask you about this as an investment of sure. your precious time and capital. We're both capital allocators. Hundreds of millions have been put into this. It, is this a venture investment? And I know when you and I talked privately, you had explained to me uh, last year at, the, at my uh, Napa conference with LPs and GPs, just how Future Ventures, your firm, is taking a longer portfolio approach to deep science and tech. I is this a venture investment? Could this possibly be done with venture dollars? A and, and how do you look at capital allocation when you're trying to solve these type of problems informed by, you know, working on Tesla, SpaceX and other, you know, and also your work on um, uh, computing, um, quantum computing, right? You've got a a, mm -hmm. a history here of working on multi-decade so problems. Maybe, projects. Yeah. Yeah. Multi-decade, let's say. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Nuclear fusion would fall on this as well. Yeah. So we, you know, as you, as you mentioned, we like to invest in big, bold, audacious uh, companies that if they succeed, history books will be written about them. And so in some sense, the, you know, if this seems like a brave new world, if it seems like, wow, it sort of captures the spark in the imagination, at least it does for me. Um, that's part of what feels like a venture opportunity. Now, as a public company, there's a number, of course, that uh, have gone public that are still venture grade return potential. There's risk, but there's return potential, right? And that's the filter we're always using in what we do. So, as you, as you may recall, we have 15-year funds. We typically invest at the early stage. But when I looked at this situation, I saw what fits the usual, the usual bill of a venture startup, a unique idea, leader in the field passionate team, a inevitable future, it seems, right? We get most of our energy from the oceans, right? In terms of the oil and gas industry, why wouldn't we get most of our minerals? And yes, I can understand there's, whenever there's change, there can be resistance to change. But if you just think beyond the friction of where we are to the, where would we be 500 years from now? It would just be surreal for me to not tap into this resource. As, as you heard, the abyssal plain covers half of the surface area of earth. I imagine if the oceans were gone, it was like, like we're talking about half of the planet just sitting there with the two dimensional resource to be picked up, right? Like, how could we not take advantage of that? And I mean, right? it's like picking up apples that have fallen from a tree, like they're going to mm -hmm. just they're wasted if we don't pick them up. So pick them up. I mean, let's mm -hmm. make an apple pie out of it. Um, <laughs> what happens when uh, you figure this out, mm -hmm. you get to production, and since nobody owns this resource, and it's, you know, anybody can go there are we going to see 50 boats from 50 countries uh, are the chinese going to launch a <laughs> fleet in here is putin going to decide he wants to come here um mm -hmm. this seems like uh it could be a free-for-all uh mm -hmm. if you do succeed well great uh, question so we have uh, the metals company have control over three license areas so we are sponsored by three developing countries so the area has much has mainly been spoken for already so china is the largest license holder as a country in fact they had five exploration licenses granted to them by the international seabed authority um russia already have an area and so do japan and singapore how do you pay Korea for those licenses is it a percentage of what you pull out or something how does that work eventually there'll be a royalty well there is a royalty being agreed as we speak but initially you uh you lay a claim so providing you're a signature to one clause and a member of the international seabed authority or sponsored by a member, you can claim an area. So we were the first company to claim an area from the reserved area because we were sponsored by developing countries. And so when they were drafting UNCLOS, they wanted developing mm. countries to participate because Got otherwise it. these opportunities are dominated by the wealthy nations. And so- um, What are the rules are around that license? Do you, do you have to take advantage of it in a certain amount of time mm. or lose it? Is it use it or lose it kind of situation? Yep. And then it's, is it, and can you only- you know, take a small amount, prove that you can utilize it, then you get to put a second claim in because why would in China, it's, it's sort of like buying domain names, just buy all of them, screw it, <laughs> right? And then well, that's what people did, they sat on them or like people are doing in Toronto or mm. New York City, 
foreigners buy up all the housing and then you can't live there. So so how do they keep uh, that sort of squatting s- situation from happening? I'm curious. There are monopoly provisions already at UNCLOS that prevent that happening. And mm-hmm. then you're given a 15-year exploration license, which okay. is cut into three five-year plans, and you have to improve the ground. So you have to spend mm-hmm. money to improve it. And then that entitles you to apply for a 30-year exploitation license over that defined area. Mm-hmm. Now we have a we have a between we estimate about a six to seven, maybe even longer year advantage over the next um, license applicant. And the reason for that is that most of the other licenses are held by sovereigns, by countries, mm. and they don't tend to be the most efficient at getting you know, commercial activity organized, whereas we've assembled uh, a world-class team who know how to develop projects. You know, mm. We've got people out of the mining industry, the oil and gas industry, the material processing, robotics, you name it. And so, you know, it's a crack team and we've been focused on getting to this uh, stage such that when those final regulations fall into place, that we're ready for production. You know, we've got our first production boat already. So, we've, you could argue we've had the cart beside the horse. We've taken a bet that the uh, UNCLOS, the rules in which uh, the Convention of the Law of the Sea is based upon, which legally binds all of those signatories to it, to put in place these regulations. Hey, startups, are you ready to launch your business without the headache? Well, with Northwest registered agent, you can set up your entire business identity in one place, just 10 clicks and 10 minutes, and they'll have your business officially formed and ready to go. They take care of everything, giving you a complete business identity setup, including a business address, phone line, website, hosting, and a free domain, all under one roof. Do you need a trademark? Well, they got you covered with their own law firm, Law on Call, and they offer full services at incredibly affordable rates without the usual runaround. Worried about privacy? Well, rest assured, because everything is covered by Northwest Privacy by Default, where they handle everything in-house, so your personal data stays protected. Northwest Registered Agent isn't just a service. It's your startup's new best friend. They've created a new category, a true one-stop shop for business formation. And Northwest loves supporting startups and is offering our listeners a $39 complete business formation package. For just $39 plus state fees, Northwest will handle your complete business identity, getting you up and running in no time. Visit northwestregisteredagent.com slash twist today. I am shocked that there is an orderly and efficient process here, Steve. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, as you so probably were when you did your diligence, yeah? Well, right. So, so pause for a sec. You can imagine my first, like, morbid fascination with the regulatory body. If you thought the Nuclear, Nuclear Regulatory Commission and, you know, 45 years of its existence not approving a single thing would be, uh, you know, a reference point to what might happen here, <laughs> uh, you might look the other way. Then you add a UN body with 168 nation states that need to all come to agreement. Yeah. Good luck with that. Well, there's a very important addendum without which this might not have, you might not have any faith that it's going to come to closure. And that is that they have a deadline. Um, and huh. that was put in place. I'll let George give the specifics, but the high level bit is if they don't get their laws put in place and the regulations finalized, then you can commence operations. And oh. kind of like the FDA, if you don't get approval back in a certain time frame, then it's de facto approved and therefore they, they move. Oh, I didn't they, know that. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That's incredible. Now, it's not exactly a parallel here in that it's not instant approval. But there's a much lower threshold for commencement voting wise. So you're not going to have a holdup where let's say one or two mm-hmm. nations just can't seem to get into agreement with the mm-hmm. rest. Um, then, then that can't hold you up any further. But, but correct me if I'm wrong in my sort of layperson summary of that heard. No, yeah. Let's ask the guy that's who's good. broadcasting from his bathtub about this. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to point out <laughs> how we're about half an hour into this. This is deep sea, baby. He's, uh, he's just doing Rod a soak. In a deep a- soak. He's just soaking in a tub right now. There's no water in it, but I don't know about your investment here, Steve. Either this one's going to the moon or you've I know, I think the it's the it's the eccentric uh, ones. I, I I'm Steve Jobs probably did an interview I'm from sure. his hot tub at yeah, some point. Yeah. With some carrot carrot oil. Eating yeah. fruit with no deodorant for three years. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Steve was a unique guy. You you knew Steve Jobs, yes, yeah, Steve? That's right. I worked with him. Yeah. You worked with him. next. Yeah, I'll <laughs> uh, we'll get to that yeah. story in a minute. But go ahead, Gerard. Well, Reporting well, live from, I don't know, where yeah, are you, Sydney? You're in Perth? Where are you? You seem like um, a Melbourne guy to me more than anything. 
Ooh. No, I'm a Queenslander. I'm a very proud Queenslander. Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah, I grew up on a dairy farm in Queensland. Yeah, and, okay. um, but today I'm in Dubai. And um, oh. yeah, so um, I've been down to um, just left Indonesia and I'm, I'm uh, yeah, so it's, it's constantly on the road sort of jobs. Still no but explanation of the bathtub, but let's keep moving. We'll just keep going. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love it. Uh, listen, it's a small hotel room. I had to. Oh, I see. My, You're in a uh, hotel. Yeah, 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 yeah. And this is, I got it. Yeah, you may be, yeah. I got it. Okay. Yeah, That's, it's it's like, totally, totally fair. My other half is asleep. I had to, it's, it's like 1230 at midnight, right? And I said, listen, I'll take it from the bathroom. Wait, are you actually in a bathroom? I thought that was just the couch that, or chair that looks like it. Listen, bathroom. I'm now going to have to, yeah. Oh, it I'm is not. a chair. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. But, it's, um, but you know, one of the interesting things, if you look at that regulatory environment, it's, um, you know, the, the, it's the developing world that really want to see this happen. Mm. And it's some of those Western European countries who are a little bit, oh, industrialization didn't work out so well for us. We should maybe slow it down. We should, you know, do we really want to do this? And of course, you've got China and all of the African group countries and, mm. you know, Japan and Korea who are saying, we need more metals. You know, there is a practicality to this. And yes. you add on top of that the geopolitics now. And I think, I'm very confident we're going to see some positive language out of the mm. US government um, because while they don't have a license area sponsorship, they uh, the, the the National Defense Authorization Act signed by um, uh, President Biden called on the DOD to carry out an urgent study on how they could benefit by processing nodules, by being able to bring them because like mm. America became energy independent with shale, it can become mineral independent because of this resource it's only a Amazing. thousand miles off the coast of mexico so we could bring yeah. them to the usa because yeah. no one wants a mine in your backyard you know Love it. you can't get a mine permitted anywhere in in the developing world in the developed world now they want to outsource that to the developing world but the problem with yeah. that is you also outsource the regulation and the environmental oversight so it's a it's a lose -lose so you got to be careful about the downstream effect you got to be thoughtful about this if we make a bunch of regulations about fishing. Yeah. You know, there are a couple of countries maybe who just decide, you know what, I don't want to be part of that organization. We'll just do whatever we want with our salmon pens in the ocean and dump uh, mm. antibiotics into them. And now we got mm. antibiotics all over the ocean. You, you really do need to be thoughtful about these downstream effects. Yes, you do. Uh, but you know, one of the things yeah. I, I, I can't not pitch this because the way we process our nodules is the same way that you process rainforest nickel. Now, the problem with rainforest nickel, as you alluded to, is you've got to remove the rainforest to get to it and all yeah. of the indigenous people and the biodiversity and the sequestered yep. carbon. But what we found is that we can replace that rainforest nickel feed with our nodules. And so mm -hmm. we've already announced our first processing partnership in Japan, where there's an existing plant. But there are more than 250 of these existing plants that are in Indonesia currently processing ah. rainforest nickel. And so we will. Oh, wow. So if they shut that down, you don't have to worry about those people losing their jobs because the processing that's plants are right. there. So yes. and while, globalization and, and I, can be beautiful in that way. Yes, it can yeah. be. Yes, it can yeah. be. And, and what I hope is that, that polymetallic nodule material processed in those plants in Indonesia can be become IRA compliant and then be bought into the USA for further refining into those battery cells. And that's a win-win. That's like, and, and also try to build a processing plant anywhere in the world is both expensive, it's capital rich and you suffer overruns, you suffer permitting risks. We've got more than 250 of them sat there wanting to do business with us. And so it's an amazing opportunity which allows us to turn the tap of supply on a whole lot faster than you would with any other resource type industry. So it's got a lot of things going for it. And of course, a new industry has to have a lot of things going for it because it's not easy to get a new industry started because it's a competitive threat. Some of the mining companies don't want to see this because they kind of like how it's going. And, and that was one of the things that we're, we're very pleased about. We've been able to stay independent as a company. We are able to make our own decisions about what gets this resource into production the soonest that it possibly can because this is, the planet uh, needs it. Amazing work. Uh, really appreciate you coming on the program. While you're in Dubai, go to Orfali Brothers, O-R-F-A-L-I, I believe, Orfali Brothers. Have you been uh, there? What kind of an institution is that? 
it's I um i think he's, you have been there i think I he's yeah. mohammed mo or yeah. um is a great chef um he's kind of yeah. like i don't want to say the gordon ramsay but well-known chef who's mm. on like tv shows in dubai but it's uh i think it's jordanian and they have these great um like uh homemade drinks they make there and breads and everything it's just you've been to our family sure. brothers it's I a have, bit of a I show have, yeah. and it's some of the best food i've had in my life but say say hi to muhammad or mo when you're yeah, there yeah. um steve i just want to say you know it's so great uh to be your friend and to watch you do this important work in the world i think you're one of the most underrated people in our industry because of your humility and how you just mm -hmm. find these opportunities and make you know, the world a bit better every time you place one of these bets, capital allocators, VCs get derided uh, all the time. Um, and rightfully so in some cases, if we're being honest. <laughs> but my Lord, the impact you've had through finding bets, placing bets, and then shepherding them to success, I think is unrivaled in our industry. You're an inspiration mm -hmm. to me. And I think a lot of the people coming up in venture and, uh, and Gerard, you're in good hands uh, with Steve. <laughs> uh, helping you out here so congratulations on landing yeah. him yeah we're very we're very uh, uh, proud to count him as a as a part of the team steve give us your best uh steve jobs story since i got you here we'll end on that that's the just story. uh yeah okay, just like uh, okay like, i don't know sometime when he blew up or he just oh, had sure. an incredible well, insight or did something <laughs> completely that none of us would ever expect or know about so I knew him during the next era, which is kind of like an era of exile, almost like Napoleon is off on the Al island of Elba, you know, like in his country is, you know, is off, you know, going down the drain, you know, you know, right before his eyes. So he was obsessed with Apple. In fact, he had a Mac keyboard on his desk at, um, at Next, and he had, like, with an ice pick, chopped out the Apple logo, the, the six-color logo, yeah, from his, de uh, from his keyboard. And, and it's sort of the symbolism of it. And whenever we went on walks… We, we, to talk about next business and the work I was doing on competitive analysis and this and that, he, he just inevitably switched to what should Apple do? What should Apple do? And he would conclude that they should rehire him. Like this was long before that happened. And I just didn't have quite the guts to tell him that's insane. You know, what person would bring you back to Apple and expect to keep their job, right? What CEO would do that, right? And, and look what happened. Um, the uh, somewhat loosely related back in 1994, um, to 95. It may have been, no, it was 94. Um, I had him over to my house. Uh, I was at school at the time and there was a high tech club meeting there. We had him speak and he sat cross legged in the lotus position in front of the fireplace to a bunch of students who were like in rapt attention. And at the end, kind of like a geek, I brought my Apple extended keyboard to ask if he'd sign it. And I already had um, Wozniak's signature on the back. And he looked at it and he was sort of startled and like taken aback. And I found out later another reason he might have been taken aback having to do with the signature. But what he said was, what is this function keys? Like F1, F2, do you use that? No. And then he took his car keys and he plopped the F1 key off. Do you use F2? No. At the end, he goes, this keyboard represents everything about Apple that I hate, right? Because it was like the, it was the Windows world that had function keys. No Mac needs function keys, right? And he literally said, and I'm not exaggerating and not adding a single word. He goes, I'm changing the world one keyboard at a time. Which I just, I was just that, that's going <laughs> to stick with you, right? Yeah. Yeah. He had a level of passion and focus yeah. that like was unrivaled. Parsimony yeah. design. It, he, I think he and Elon share one attribute in their product design uh, aesthetic, which is I think both suffer a visceral pain and agitation from visual imperfection. If something doesn't line up, if it's not done right, things mm. that you may not even see, um, parts of the product. Oh, that Elon hidden, hidden went crazy view. about that. I was driving in, you know, a Model X at one point, and I had to like pull the car over because there was wind coming from one of the early prototypes mm -hmm. he, he lost his mind over the gap of the mm -hmm. window and the thing and he was like just like he's taking notes he's texting people taking pictures and i was like calm down brother we're just going to dinner like it's gonna be okay but it exactly. really annoyed him that there was a little whistling coming from it mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and, uh, and the alignment you know, of the tinting on the window with the frame. Like, I couldn't see yeah. it, but they were like not perfectly parallel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. little Incredible. things like that. I mean, and then Apple today, Steve, your take on their inability to launch a new interesting product since Steve's yeah. roadmap seems to have been exhausted and they've rung every last song out of, and scrap of a lyric out of his incredible catalog. I mean, what would you yeah, do no, it's, it's, to save it's Apple somewhat, at this point? 
I'm not sure what it takes to save it. I mean, you look at Microsoft and you see there, there is potential with new leadership. Yeah. I mean, under Ballmer, it was just a train wreck, right? Yeah, sideways um, for a decade, lost decade. Yeah. And in this case, uh, you know, Titan, with the car project being canceled, all kinds of misfires like, uh, you know, the VR. I mean, like VR, hello, this is dead on arrival. Hello. Yeah. Uh, it's just, it's just sad. It's sad for me as an Apple enthusiast. Um, I do believe in their potential, but I think if you look at the long arc of Apple or Google or any large company, they only make a difference in the world when they enter a new business, not when they try to restructure or reinvent their core, right? So mm. even before the post-Jobs era, when Jobs was riding high, there was nothing new in desktop or laptop computing that mattered from Apple. There's nothing you point to yeah. in the last 20 years that's you know improved. No. Right? It's only when they entered a business they weren't formally in. And this is sort of the broader rule of business that I take that is almost inviolate, is that no incumbent revolutionizes or makes meaningful change in their core business. And so the key question for Apple is, what new business do they want to get into that they're not currently in? Because you're not going to see them mm. innovate in mobility. You're not going to see them innovate you have in an desktops idea. If or If you laptops. were on the board, if they had the absolute insight to put you on the board and to help with secession from Tim Cook, who's going to retire at some point, what markets would you look towards? What problems would you try to solve? Yeah. Well, I have one that came to me today, well, but well, AI, I want to hear yours. You know, and, you know, <laughs> ideally looking beyond the, you know, let's all hunch over in our phones and, and lose ourselves into the, mm. you know, short focal length screens that are, yeah. are my, literally our myopic future, right? Um, yeah. Black Mirror. Yeah. So some AI first first person experience it's not the humane pin it's not you know the rabbit it might be glasses i don't think it's the earphone based things that some people are working on i don't know what the answer is hmm. so often as an investor you gave me some you know incredible praise a moment ago but what i wouldn't say that i do particularly well is envision products the way entrepreneurs do hmm. the best that i do is try to search in the waters for adjacencies to big unbent needs and then hmm. ha, when i see something that looks unique something unlike anything i've seen before but adjacent to where i've been ah. i can sort of move quickly and say that They've got it. So I, I'm got looking it. a lot around, you know, what, how does AI reshape our world? I think here's a high level bit. We'll look back from the not too distant future and say, oh yeah, that was the age of AI, right? Just yes, like it was the age of mobility. Of course, right? The Cloud, age of the internet, the mobile, age of computing, broadband, right? Broadband, like, yeah. So it's going to be something around that. And I don't think the user interface has been figured out yet for how mm. best to bring that with you in a way that's persistent, uh, ambient, uh, and passive, right? Yeah. They're always at your side. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah. I had a, an interesting thought today. Uh, I was like, why, you know, this, it, when people have like fancy houses, they have like Questron, Savant, Control 4, all these systems are garbage. Every time I buy a house and new so things bad. are in it, I rip it out and I just go with Apple TV <laughs> yep. and Sonos because they're simple and they work and they're elegant. And then I was thinking, well, what the hell does an Apple take over my home and just make this smooth? And they're just like, yeah, no, we just have a, a home app, but we don't do your speakers we don't do all mm -hmm. the cameras we don't do any of that and then i was like wait a second i have to open the aperture here why don't they work on housing mm. itself and itself because mm -hmm. steve jobs last inspiring product was the mothership that was his that was his like the signature right mm -hmm. yeah when he built that round mothership mm -hmm. that was inspired what if apple took that inspiration of the mothership and then built those like, you know, James Dolan's building the sphere, you know, like a mm -hmm. new architecture, a new way to live. Apple building, it sounds insane, housing, which is one of the pressing problems in the world and having, I don't know if it's ADUs like Joe Jebbia is doing, uh, the co-founder of Airbnb with his backyard dwellings, but imagine Apple going after housing. Yeah. So. Uh the beauty of this is, you know, before Apple got into music, it was perceived as insane that they would make a pivot like, like yes. what, what in the world? Do you, wh what? Right? You have any business uh, there? Yeah. Other than the brand violation of Apple Records, there's no connection here uh, that anyone can <laughs> see. I don't know whether Apple does it. They might. But someone who's not in the construction industry yes. should revolutionize the construction industry. Back to that earlier mm. point. Because it has actually slid backwards over the past 30 years in labor productivity, which is yes. insane. It is growing as a percent of global GDP. It's becoming less efficient. And, uh, you know, we haven't seen a major revolutionary change in how we build buildings in forever, right? So it, from everything from architecture and site selection through final build materials and everything in between, so much potential. And this so is an area we're also kind of like a prepared mind trying to find entrepreneurs who are going to show us the, yeah. ah, 
you know, is it a variant Obvious. on prefab? Is it a variant on build on location? Is it, you know, with like 3D printing, which has pluses and minuses, a lot of minuses, frankly. Yeah, but a lot of minuses. Something, that's not something new. Something. something that when you see it, you're like, oh, of course, that's how we'll be doing it 50 years from now. There were a couple. I, I invested in a company called Blockable that didn't make it. I was doing like build it in the factory and then mm -hmm. place it and then making like Lego so you could stack them. Terra was, I guess, Masayoshi yeah, San's sure. yep. bet. That yep. was a disaster. They tried to boil yep. the ocean. Yep. It didn't well, work. Well, they got soft bank money. That tends to ruin you. It, yeah, it's kind of like... Like here's $400 maybe, million dollars in, now. Well, you know, yeah, why? Why does that ruin well, companies kind of like when we they were, have that dropped on their head? Imagine a competitor and you're actually yeah. managing your business responsibly. And then here's this overfunded company plops in your industry. First, it makes it harder for you to raise money to compete. Second, they're spending like drunken sailors and it kind yeah. of ruins the pricing point for everyone. So mm -hmm. I've seen it. I would go farther to say not only does a soft bank investment tend to ruin the company they invest in, it tends to ruin the whole industry for a bit of time. While it's just too much capital, too when much a distortion. Not ready to put it to use, right? And so yeah. you can cover up for a lot of sloppy uh, thinking on business dynamics. You you don't grow by learning from your customers. You grow by listening to what Mazioshi said. Says, "Hey, here's another bag of money. You're not thinking yeah. big enough. You're not crazy enough." You know, like, yeah, well, it is. It's, it's, it's just it crazy. can drown a company. All yeah. right, Gerard, you you got to hear me do a yeah. micro interview of Steve Jarvis and. <laughs> Apologies to have you on as a guest and then and then hijack it. But when I get Steve, he's super busy and no, I have no to ask all. him a couple of questions. Um, you're hiring, I understand. What, what positions do you need to fill? And, and if people want to save the planet, how can mm. they apply to join your team, Gerard? You know, we have um, we we always have vacancies for environmental scientists, and mm. we we have an amazing team already. We have over. 100 scientists working on the program now, but most of them are through our partners. Um, only mm -hmm. about 10 of them are on our team. and But we always want to see more people there. We've got ah. an amazing team. One of the great things about our business model is, you know, we're, we're going to be very capital light, but it also means, you know, we get to rely on our partners like all seas who for 40 mm -hmm. years have been the world's leading high players in the deep ocean for oil and gas. So they bring all that expertise and they're going to operate got our it. first production vessel. So we've got to keep our core team really tight. And, got um, it. and we're, about, no we're about permitting, we're about social license and environmental What's oversight. the website so people can go check it out uh, if metals, they want to learn more? Metals.co and our ticker is TMC. There you go. All right, everybody. We'll see you next time on This Week in Startups. Bye-bye.